Hello all, welcome to Get Into IAS and in this video, we are going to deal with the fourth chapter that is poverty and unemployment. So first, let's deal with the definition of poverty and unemployment. What is poverty? Poverty simply means that a session of the society that is unable to fulfill its basic necessities of life. You should decode this meaning that is what is the basic necessities of life. Food, clothing and shelter are the basic necessities of life. If in case a part of the society is not able to fulfill any one of these, it means they are pushed to poverty. So poverty is nothing but it is a session of the society that is unable to fulfill its basic necessities of life. So if it is not able to fulfill any one of these, they will be pushed to poverty. Next, what is called as an unemployment. Unemployment is a situation where the individuals are ready to work and willing to work but do not get work. So in case if I'm unemployed, that means I will be searching for work, but no one is ready to give me or provide me work. So that is termed as unemployment. Unemployment doesn't mean that I'm idle of work, but I am searching for work, but in case I'm not getting work. So that is termed as unemployment. So in India, how is this poverty and unemployment measured? So there are two ways to measure poverty and un unemployment. First thing is the consumer expenditure surveys. So the government does various surveys in terms of consumer expenditure. So we are the consumer in the economy, how much we are spending. So expenditure is how much we are spending. So that survey is called as consumer expenditure survey. Second thing is employment and unemployment survey. So all these surveys are taken care by NSSO. So NSSO now comes under NSO. So NSSO is National Sample Survey Organization. Now it is merged with CSO to form NSO. So what is NSO? National Statistical Office is termed as NSO and Central Statistical Organization plus National Sample Survey Organization together is brought under the NSO, National Statistical Office. So this NSSO is headed by the Secretary of Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation, very important for prelims. Okay, so this NSSO is headed by whom? Secretary of Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation heads NSSO. So the CSO and NSO earlier were two different bodies. Later, they were merged to form NSO by the recommendation of which committee? So by the recommendation of Rangarajan committee, this is very important for both your prelims and mains. So in case if you are writing about NSO or CSO or NSSO, you can quote this point as uh, Rangarajan committee gave the recommendation to merge CSO and NSSO to form NSO. Okay. Uh, so in prelims, they may change the committee name. So in case uh, of Rangarajan committee, they may give Urjit Patil committee. So you have to know the committees which has recommended for the merger of various organizations. Fine. Okay. So next is the consumption expenditure. So I already told you all the poverty and unemployment in India is first measured through consumer expenditure or consumption expenditure surveys. So how is this survey measured? First thing is it is collected by National Sample Survey Organization NSSO which is now brought under NSO. Fine. So they are collecting this consumer expenditure or the consumption expenditure from 1972 to 73 in quin annual terms that is five years once they will collect the surveys okay data. So this is done both national and state level. So this is done for the whole of India. This survey is done, no? The consumption expenditure survey is done for the whole of India and the various states inside the uh, India is also calculated under the consumption expenditure. So what is this consumption expenditure used? What is the objective of taking the surveys? Okay. So what is the objective is you can do planning. So the government will know how much people are consuming on what people are consuming, how much they are giving the expenditure, how much they are spending their money. So for that, government will know how to plan and where to plan. Next is government can formulate policies and schemes for the consumers. That is us. Next formulation and uh, policy formulation decision making government will know in which area to make a proper decision so this is all used by the government this data is all used by the national and state level governments okay so household consumer expenditure so how is this household consumer expenditure calculated see for example i am spending my money on certain things okay so i am inside the household 
So my household expenditure will account for example in case I am having a farm in that farm I may sow various crops. So that crops will be used by me myself alone. So that is called as own consumption. So how I am spending on the farm for the seeds, fertilizers, pesticides for all this I will be spending and I will be using it on my own. I am not selling it outside. I am using all the farm produce only for myself. So that is my consumer expenditure, my consumption expenditure. Fine. In case if I am doing uh, construction in, in uh, land, that will not come under consumption expenditure. In case if I am paying my uh, interest, so in case if in a, in a bank, if I have got any loan, if I am paying interest for that loan, that will won't account under the household consumer expenditure. If I am paying any fine or penalties, all this won't come under what? Household consumer expenditure. So normally the basic idea is, in case if I'm having a land, for that land if I'm spending each and every penny and if I'm reaping the crops inside that, using it for my own consumption, I'm consuming those things. So that uh, expenditure will come under household consumer expenditure. Fine. So uh, there is an important term called as headcount. Headcount is we are taking on the whole as a household. So you should calculate for each and every percentage how much he is spending, how much she is spending inside the household. So for that, monthly per capita expenditure is calculated. So MPCE, so this is called as monthly per capita expenditure. So this has a formula that is the household monthly consumer expenditure divided by the household size. That is how much they are spending. How much they are spending is called as household monthly consumer expenditure in a month divided by the household size. Household size is the how many members are present inside the house. In case 5 members, 4 members that is called as household size. So this is how you will derive the monthly per capita expenditure. How much per person is spending his expenditure. Fine. So there is a reference period or recall period for this. That is you need to collect the data either uh, weekly or monthly or yearly. So that is called as reference period or recall period. So in case if I am inside the household, I should give all my data to the government. Okay, who's, whoever is collecting the data, I should give proper details to them. So that is called as recall period. So in case weekly or monthly if I report, so report for collection of MPEC, monthly per capita expenditure, they will take the data for weekly or monthly. So what are all the items inside the uh, monthly per capita expenditure? So what and all I am spending, they will calculate the data. First thing is for food. For food, how much I am spending? For tobacco, how much I am spending? For clothing, how much I am spending? Footwear and goods and services, that is the miscellaneous goods and services, all will come un under this head. So these are the three subheadings under which they will calculate the data for monthly per capita expenditure okay so how much amount i'm spending for food how much amount i'm spending for clothing all this will be calculated either weekly or monthly fine so there is a separate subheading called as uniform mpec uniform monthly per capita expenditure it is recorded for 30 days uniform means so for the past 30 days they'll measure the how much expenditure i have done in food clothing and the, all these goods and services. What is called as mixed monthly per capita expenditure. For the last 365 days, that is for the past one year, how much expenditure I have done in all these subheadings. Next, what is called as modified MPEC, modified monthly per capita expenditure. That is for the last seven days, how much I have spent, that is the expenditure, my expenditure on food, clothing and the miscellaneous product. So this is how the headcount is calculated under the uh, various subheadings used under the consumption expenditure or consumer expenditure service. So the main point you have to note down is about NSSO and who gave the recommendation that is the Rangarajan committee, the definition for poverty and unemployment and uh, the consumer expenditure survey and employment and unemployment surveys done by whom that is NSSO which is now under the NSO. So this is all about consumer expenditure. So the next approach to measure poverty is income consumption poverty or monetary metric poverty. So it is measured in terms of money value or monetary value. That is why it's called as income or consumption poverty. Fine. So how much people are spending in order to consume things. Fine. So that is called as the money metric poverty. So in this the 61st round of NSSO National Sample Survey Organization on its 2004-05 report has estimated that the poverty line for rural India is 356.30. Uh, so this is the 
monetary value they gave. Next for urban India, it is 538.60. So this is the estimated cost of spending in both rural and urban. So in case if people is spending below this, they will be termed as below poverty line poor. And in case in urban area, if people are spending below this, they are called as below poverty line people in the urban area. So approaches to poverty estimation, how will they estimate poverty in India? How to approach the poverty line? First is the subsistence approach. Next one is the basic needs approach. There are actually three kinds of approach. Subsistence approach, basic needs approach, relative deprivation approach. So what is subsistence? From the word subsistence, you know the meaning of subsistence. That is for oneself. Fine. So it is an individual level. Measuring poverty on an individual scale. So if poverty is measured for me, that is called a subsistence poverty. So for example, the food, tobacco, fuel, clothing, all this footwear will taken into uh, will be taken into account under the subsistence approach. Next, subsistence approach is unidimensional because uni means one. Only I am involved in the poverty estimation. So it is called as unidimensional. Next, coming to the basic needs approach, it is a community level approach, fine. So, the basic needs of a whole society or a community will be taken into consideration for poverty estimation, fine. So, under this, broader perspective will be seen, for example, the sanitation of the community, the sanitation of the area, the education the area is being getting and then the health care is being received. So, all these are the indices to be calculated under the basic needs approach. So, this is a multidimensional poverty estimation approach because since a subsistence approach is unidimensional this is multidimensional because the area which is covering is very broader and it's come it and it is taking into account the community level poverty estimation fine and not the individual level poverty estimation next what is relative deprivation approach when you see the term relative it means that you are comparing with something else okay so this approach is broader than the other two that is it's broader than the subsistence approach and the basic needs approach fine so the deprivation an individual or a group face compared to others so what is if in case i am compared to another person and uh, the poverty estimation between we both the data between we both will be jotted down so that is called as what relative deprivation so this is for an individual so in case a community one is compared with community two so what are the deprivations community one is facing so what are the deprivation in which the community two is facing that is uh, some uh, aspects of the sanitation or education or health care the community one will be getting so in case community one will be getting a proper education but community two won't be getting a proper education in fact and the next thing is, uh, so over here the community one will be getting better sanitation. Over here community two won't be getting better sanitation. So this is the difference in the relative deprivation approach. So relative means comparing between two individuals or comparing between two community or two or more communities. Fine. So these are the three approaches under the poverty estimation. So subsistence, next one basic needs, third one relative. So this is the diagram you have to remember that is subsistence is for an individual unidimensional and basic needs is multidimensional. So when comparing between these two, the relative deprivation approach is much wider than the other two approach. Fine. Next coming to the absolute versus relative poverty. So what is absolute poverty? Absolute poverty means poverty line based on the subsistence approach. We already saw what is the subsistence approach. That is for the individual level, the food, tobacco, fuel, clothing and footwear. It will be very unidimensional. So this approach is taken into consideration under absolute poverty. So there will be a line. So this line is called as reference line or reference point. So if people fall below the reference point, this these people are called as below poverty line people so below poverty line bpl families you you come across the word bpl below poverty line families so there will be a reference point set and under this reference point who and all falls below the reference point they will be termed as below poverty line families so in india you know the estimated uh, the monetary value is 356.30 so below this how many people are there in the poverty line? So around 170.3 million rural poor people are there in India. So the total population, when you compare it with the total Indian population, if Indian population is 100 percentage, 21.8 people are under what? 
below poverty line in the rural area that is we have so much of rural poor okay it's a very huge number and next coming to the relative poverty and next coming to the relative poverty i already told you all relative means you have to compare between two things so over here when you compare the income so there are two income people that is the top group and there will be a bottom group fine so over here 40 to 50 percentage of the income some people will be getting so in india some people will be getting around 40 to 50 rupees when you when you take the 100 rupees as the baseline fine so this 40 to 50 may not be poor but when you are comparing with the people who earn 60 to 70 per day when comparing to the 100 rupees baseline they are definitely considered poor when compared to the 60 to 70 income group line fine so this is what is termed as relative poverty when you are comparing when you are comparing between two sets of people based on the income so based on the income you are comparing that is called as relative poverty so under this the inequality that exists in the society very important so under relative poverty when you are comparing between two groups a society or community the inequality is measured that exists in the society is compared and jotted down so these are the poverty estimations that is the three estimations on which we approach poverty and next is the absolute poverty versus the relative poverty so next let's deal with how to measure inequality so the measures of inequality so there are a lot of measures to deal with inequality the first method is quintile income ratio what is quintile income ratio is so quintile is the whole population will be divided into five subgroups in case take we have 100 percentage of population in our india so in our economy it will be divided into five subgroups so 0 to 20, 21 to 40, 41 to 60, 61 to 80, 81 to 100. So these are the five subgroups. A population may be divided into five subgroups. The top 20 percentage and the bottom 20 percentage is taken into account. So this 0 to 20, 81 to 100. So top 20 percentage and the bottom 20 percentage will be taken into account. So the quintile income ratio. So what is the formula for calculating inequality? Okay. So for, so for the top 20 percentage, the average income of the richest 20 percentage. So all these 20 percentage of people, the average income. So these are the richest people. So the average income will be calculated. Next in the ratio, average income of the poorest 20 percentage. The poorest bottom 20 percentage of the people, their average income will be calculated. And we will arrive at and we will arrive a ratio so that is called as quintile income ratio fine so this is how we will calculate inequality so next thing is the lorenz curve very very important curve so what is a lorenz curve so this is the diagrammatical representation of lorenz curve fine so over here so in the y axis the percentage of income wealth that is the wealth accumulated in the percentage of the population in our economy that is so many people has acquired so many income is along the y axis what is along the x axis that is the percentage of people who has acquired the wealth so the number of people will come along the x axis number of uh, the number of people will come along the x axis the percentage of the income they earned will come along the y axis so this straight line between a to b is called as line of equality that is there prevails equality in the economy so this curve right a e and b this is called as the lorenz curve so this lorenz curve is the a e and b so how with the diagrammatical representation you will calculate so many people have earned so many income okay so if you see a e b is the lorenz curve if this is the line of equality a b is the line of equality a e b that is the lorenz curve is the line of inequality fine so lorenz curve is what the line of inequality so over here 90 percentage of the people have acquired 60 percentage of the income if you see this is the x-axis is the number of people over here from here till here you have 90 percentage take total 100 percentage in this from here to here 90 percentage of the people are there how much income they have acquired so this is the x-axis so this is the y-axis the income so they have acquired how much percentage of income they have acquired 60 percentage of the income the remaining 10 percentage over here have acquired how much the remaining 40 percentage of income so this is how with the help of lorenz curve you can calculate how many people have earned how many income fine 
and next comes the Gini coefficient. Gini coefficient is always attached to the Lorentz curve. Okay, so this is also the measure of inequality. It measures inequality using Lorentz curve. Very important. With the help of Lorentz curve, the Gini coefficient is calculated. Fine. So the Gini coefficient. What is the formula for Gini coefficient? That is the area between Lorentz curve and the line of equality. So this area, the area between the Lorentz curve and the line of equality divided by the area below the line of equality. So this is the area below the line of equality that is called as the Gini coefficient. So Gini coefficient you can write it as A E B divided by A C B. So the area between this is A E B, the area between below the line of equality is A C B. So this is represented here. So the Gini coefficient varies from 0 to 1. So you guys tell me in the comment box if 0 is perfect equality or 1 is perfect equality or 0 is perfect inequality or 1 is perfect inequality. You guys mention below the comment box. Fine. Okay. I am leaving this to you. Next one. Poverty estimation in India. How do we estimate poverty in India? So we are talking about poverty estimation approaches and then we are talking about how to measure inequality. So how we are measuring poverty in India. Fine. So poverty elevation to improve the standard of living. So after independence, one of our main goals set by India was that is a planning commission or any commission is poverty elevation because a lot of people was under the below poverty line. Okay, they were pushed to poverty. So our main goal was that is India's main goal was to lift the people from poverty that is called as poverty elevation. So why we are lifting them from poverty is to improve the standard of living. So we should improve the standard of living. So give them basic amenities like sanitation, healthcare, education, all this should be increased. First of all, in the first place, you should provide them what? Employment. That is why poverty and un unemployment merges with one another. Okay. So next is how we are measuring poverty in India. First thing is subsistence approach. I already told you all subsistence is the individual level approach. Fine. So individual le level approach is the absolute poverty. We already saw about the absolute poverty versus the relative poverty. So in absolute poverty, you have two important things to be noted down. That is absolute poverty is in terms of numbers. How many people are below the poverty line? So there will be a, a reference point. So below this reference point, how many people are there? So we already saw in rural India, among 21% of the people are below the poverty line. Fine. So that is called as absolute. We know the absolute number of people who are pushed to poverty. So we have cost of basic needs, CBN approach and next under the absolute poverty you have food energy intake, FEI approach. Okay. So under the cost of basic needs, under the CBN approach, we have food poverty line and next we have aggregate poverty line. What is food poverty line? So under the food poverty line, the basket of food will be taken into account and people will be calculated and the poverty will be calculated according to the people who intakes the food. Next aggregate poverty line is both food basket and the non-food basket will be taken into account and the total aggregate value for calculating poverty will be considered. What is food energy intake? Food energy intake is specifically a common term that is the calories. How many calorie I am consuming? How many calorie my household is consuming? So it is the calorie in intake. Over here food poverty line is basically a basket of food basket of food but over here it is the calorie intake how many calories we intake per day so calorie consumption is found and poverty line is fixed so how many calories I am intaking so according to that the poverty line is fixed over here also food is consumed over here food and over here to food is consumed so over here totally cost of basic needs also we have food intake in food energy intake also we have food intake so overall on the two approaches people are calculated that is the poverty is calculated according to the expenditure we make to the food non-food items and again the calorie intake so all these the poverty is estimated on how much expenditure we make on food plus non-food items fine so now let's deal with employment and unemployment i already told you all that the nsso national sample survey organization conducts various employment and unemployment surveys in india fine so we have employment indicators to calculate what to calculate the employment and unemployment in india so the first thing is labor force participation rate so what is the formula for labor force participation rate is the number of employed 
plus the number of unemployed divided by the total population. So who are all the employed people? So if I am working in a firm, I am termed as an employed person. Who is an unemployed person is, he has the capacity to work, but he is not able to find a job. So those people, those category will come under unemployed, but they will be willing to work. So unemployed is not sitting idle and I'm not willing to go to work. So the, those people are not called as unemployed people. Those who have the capacity to work and still are finding jobs are called as unemployed. So these two, the sum of these two divided by the total population is called as the labor force participation rate or LBPR, okay, LFPR. Next is the worker population ratio. So only this one, the number of employed divided by the total population that is who are in actual employment is called as the workforce. So who, what is a workforce? Who are actually in the original employment, working. So the working people is called as workforce. So this is worker population ratio. Next is the proportion unemployed. So who are all the unemployed people? So this is the second part of the first formula that is the number of unemployed divided by the total population by this we will know how many people are really trying to find jobs okay this is proportion unemployed or pu next is the unemployment rate so what is an unemployment rate is the number of unemployed person so unemployment rate is the number of unemployed person divided by the number of employed plus number of unemployed so this a formula will be like unemployment ratio ur that is the number of people who are seeking job divided by the number of who is actually in the workforce plus number of people who are seeking job so this is the formula for unemployment rate fine so next coming to the topic economic activity so what is called as an economic activity so if an activity results in production of goods and services so in our economy if we are producing any goods or if we are providing any services that is called as an economic activity simply means that we are adding something to the national income so we are contributing from our side to the national income that is called as economic activity so economic activity is divided into two subheadings the first one is the market activity second one is the non-market activity so what is called as the market activity that is inside a market you will employ a lot of people that is if in case i am having a firm or a company i will employ a lot of people say around 10 to 20 people so i should pay them in wages so what i'm paying for the monthly salary or the weekly salary that is called as wages and in the business i will tend to take profit so this is called as a market activity so i am producing some goods or i'm providing some services by that i am gaining some amount of profit that is called as an economic activity so the production of goods and services either by private or by government is called as a market activity so even the government welfare schemes like various Jal Jeevan mission, you would have heard about Jal Jeevan mission providing tap connectivity for the rural areas, rural areas within 2024. This is a welfare scheme by the government. So this also contributes to an economic activity because by that you are employing a lot of people. So that is an economic activity, right? So next one is the non-market activity. That is activities for own purpose. If I am doing something only for myself, that is not a, that does not come under market activity. Activity. that will come under non-market activity for example if I am producing in my own land cereals and grains for myself and for my family it is called as non-market activity housing construction for example if I have a land and with the help of my family members I construct a building so that is for myself my subsistence that does not contribute to the market activity so I do not pull in people and give them employment instead I use my own family workforce for the construction purpose or the cereals and grain sowing purpose okay so that comes under the non-market activities next very important thing is some illegal activities like smuggling you would have heard about various uh, gadget smuggling and all so all that also comes under economic activity because monetary value money is involved in that next prostitution and begging for example does not come under an economic activity so you have to clearly demarcate between what comes under an economic activity what doesn't come under an economic activity fine so now coming to the broad activity status that is who are all inside the employment and who are all outside the employment that is called as broad activity status that is First thing, who and all are considered inside the working age group or working population. 
that is they are engaged in economic activity the people who are engaged in economic activity comes under the working population next not engaged in economic activity but they are seeking for work i already said you all some people are not engaged in any economic activity but they are in search of any job so they are called as unemployed fine so the last thing third uh, status is not seeking some people right they are not engaged in economic activity as well as they are not seeking any kind of job they are sitting idle for their lifetime so these people they won't come under the labor force so first two category that is who are all engaged in the economic activity constitute the workforce in our economy and the second thing who are unemployed but they are searching for job so these two categories comes under the labor force as i earlier said next this last category who doesn't come under any economic activity or they are not searching for any jobs they constitute the not in the labor force so these two working group constitute the labor force this doesn't constitute any labor force okay so there are different approaches to calculate the employment rate first one is the usual activity status for example under the usual activity status one year 365 days is taken as reference period for example from today the previous 365 days is taken into account under the usual activity status how many people are engaged in the labor force how many are not engaged in the labor force how many are under the unemployed category so all this comes under the usual activity status for one year next thing is the current weekly status so from this term you'll know the reference period is one week so if today i'm taking the if today i want to know the activity status i'll be referring the past 7 days so how many people are in the labor force how many are not in the labor force how many are unemployed so all this will be taken into account for the past 7 days next is current daily status so the reference period here will be for each and every day i'll be calculating the people who are in the labor force and people who are not in the labor force so this is a very comprehensive approach okay comprehensive approach next thing is the usual status activity so under the usual status activity i said for 365 days the reference period is 365 days right so under this we have usual principal activity status that is under the usual principal activity status the 365 days is the reference period inside 365 days majority of the days if you are working you will come under the usual principal activity status for example if i am working for 365 days in 365 days if i am working for more than 150 days so i will come under usual principal activity status what is called as subsidiary status so on the 300 so if you take the reference period for 365 days if i'm engaged in work for at least 30 days i'll come under subsidiary status okay so on the whole 365 days this 30 days is not continuous you can it can be like in january i'll be working 5 days and in march i'll be working 5 days so like this 30 days will be taken into account in a year so on the whole this is called as subsidiary status so when you are comparing usual status activity under that you have two subheadings one is the usual principal activity status under this on a whole on the one year majority of the days if you are working you will come under the usual principal activity status subsidiary status is on the 365 days if you are working for at least minimum 30 days it will be calculated under the subsidiary status okay so employed and unemployed the people who are in the labor force not in the labor force will be calculated next thing is the current weekly status so current weekly status is the 7 day period fine so on this one or on one day so for 7 days right first day if i work 1 hour second day if i work 1 hour third day if i work 1 hour so i'll be termed as employed so in the past 7 days for at least 1 hour you should be working in a day so this will come under the current weekly status and you will be termed as employed in case if you are not working that minimum 1 hour in a day you will be termed as unemployed or not in the labor force next the last thing is current daily status so under the current daily status mostly this approach is carried forward in the unorganized sector so unorganized sector the workforce will be calculated using the current daily status so for example you take agriculture fine so if i have a land for agriculture i have sown any wheat or rice in that land so inside that we we need irrigation facility 
so when you are having electricity so when the electricity is there you will provide irrigation to the land so only during that time only when you are providing irrigation you will be employed for that day so in one day the day will be split into two halves okay for example when you are taking one day as the reference period for current daily status this one day will be split into two or you can take the whole one full day for the employment status in this one day or the half a day four hours or more if you are working you will come under the employed status if you are working between one to four hours that means you are working only for half a day so i already told you all a day should be separated into half and half if you are working one hour to four hours you will come under the half a day working fine so next coming to the types of unemployment we have various kinds of unemployment the first thing is the structural unemployment so you know our population is rapidly growing so india is the second populous country after china correct so india is rapidly growing and with this rapid population growth we have various technological advancement or technological changes fine and we have very less growth in the capital formation so all these three taken into account is the structural unemployment all these three things give way to the structural unemployment in our economy first thing is the rapid population growth second is the technological changes that is happening at a faster rate third thing is we are not able to construct the capital formation at a faster rate so all these three club together is the structural unemployment so the structural unemployment is a long term in nature that is it goes on for a very long period of time currently the indian youths right so indian uh, people are facing the structural kind of unemployment in our economy so after structural unemployment the next kind of unemployment is frictional unemployment so what is a frictional unemployment take me as an example if i am jumping from one job to another job in case of my salary so in this job they may be providing me 10k as a salary so if in case in another job they are providing me 20k the salary outcome is more so hence i'll tend to jump from this job to this job and various economic um, and various employment conditions like the working hours will be less they may provide me social security benefits so if all that are perfect i'll jump from this job to another job so this is called as frictional unemployment so this jumping time right so i'll be moving from this job to this job so this remaining time in the middle so that is called the friction uh, there will be a friction in the middle so that is otherwise called as attrition so this attrition is the frictional unemployment so mostly this kind of frictional unemployment will take place in the software industry so software industry people tend to move from one job to another job they'll shift from one company one software company to another shop, one software company to another software company in search of a better salary better employment conditions and so on and so forth next thing is the cyclical unemployment so what is the cyclical unemployment take a business cycle for example if i'm doing any business or if you take the or if you take in our economy there are various businesses okay so in a business cycle first there will be a boom so you can take an example of our economy also there will be a boom after boom there will be a slowdown after slowdown there will be recession after recession there will be recovery so this is called as a business cycle i will explain each and every term here so you know what is a boom a boom is a sudden enlargement so next is slowdown after boom there will be a slowdown okay so what is called as a slowdown so in our economy it is divided into four quarters so our financial year is divided into four quarters this four quarters was started from 1996 only okay so previously before that our economy the gdp was calculated on a whole year basis from 1996 only we started dividing our year financial year into four quarters that is three months each quarter 3 3 3 3 totally we'll have 12 months in a, a whole so this is quarter 1 quarter 2 quarter 3 and quarter 4 for example take 2020 to 2021 the first quarter is the first 3 months fine so the gdp growth rate for the first quarter will be 6.5 after it will reduce to 5.6 after it will reduce to 5.2 after it will reduce to 5.1 you can see the decline in the gdp growth rate right so that is called a slowdown so i told boom after boom you will experience a slowdown in the business cycle so business cycle you can see the gdp is going down and down fine next is what is a recession so take the same quarter 
quarter 1 and quarter 2 or any quarter quarter 2 or quarter 3 quarter 3 or quarter 4 so in any financial year if you take any two consecutive quarters if the gdp growth rate goes negative that is called as recession for example now currently what we are experiencing right so our gdp growth rate went to minus 23.9 approximately 24 percentage it went a gdp growth rate went on minus next after that next quarter also it came to minus 7 so continuously you are seeing 2 minus a gdp growth rate has gone negative in the two quarters so that is termed as recession so you have to keep this in mind it's very important for prelims perspective okay when you are considering two quarters if a gdp growth rate goes in negative terms that is called as recession what is called as a depression then so after recession in the diagram you can see depression so what is a depression is severe recession this minus minus gdp growth rate prolongs for a longer time our economy will face depression so these are all the basic terms in our economy fine so i, I was telling about the cyclical unemployment and the business cycle so what is all about the business cycle so under this business cycle if our economy faces slowdown first recession second depression third in all these condition our economy will face unemployment due to lack of demand that is called as cyclical unemployment i will explain it very easily to you all so first there is a business firm okay there is a business firm so in the economy there is a lower demand so in case uh, if yesterday 100 units of uh, bags was demanded by the economy today there will be only 10 units of bags demanded by the economy fine in the market so there is a lower demand in the economy so what will the business or the firm tend to do they will lower the production see 100 units of bags was needed yesterday today only 10 units of bags are needed so hence what he'll do he'll cut his production so while cutting the production he will cut the employment also so the many job opportunities will be lost so that will lead to unemployment so this is called as cyclical unemployment so when you're coming to cyclical unemployment you should remember the business cycle and due to slowdown and recession and depression unemployment will cause mainly because of lowering of demand in our economy next thing is disguised unemployment what is called as a disguised unemployment so the thing is when a person is employed he contributes to the production right whenever some person is employed he contributes to the production economic activity but in a disguised unemployment a person might tend to work so he is working actually but he is not contributing anything to the economic activity so that is called as disguised unemployment so i'll tell you all with an example see if uh, in a factory six people are employed okay and they are producing 24 units of bags per day next tomorrow one more person is getting added so the seventh person is getting added and the factory is producing 26 units so what is the additional units of bag only two units of bags are added to the uh, firm so this is called as marginal product so this additional two unit created by the seventh person is called as marginal product when you compare and see, see six people are producing 24 units, that one person is contributing only to two bags, two units of bags in the firm. So that is a very meager amount, marginal product. So this doesn't contribute so much to the business firm and hence that is termed as disguised unemployment. So in India, mostly the disguised unemployment is seen in agricultural sector. For example, my father may own a land and uh, we four of us, my father, mother, my brother and me, we work in the land. But in that land needs only, but that land needs only two people's work. That is my father and my mother's work. So hence, if we are sitting idle in the firm, we tend to work in the same farm. So we are sitting idle in the farm. So hence, we tend to work on the farm. So we two people are considered as disguised unemployment. We are adding nothing to the production. Okay. So this is what is called as disguised unemployment. Mostly this is seen in the uh, Indian agriculture fine so this you can use in your mains answer writing or it can be get reflected in your prelims also fine next one is educated unemployment so what is educated unemployment from the term educated you may know that a person is already educated so failed for his qualification in education and his skills he may have various education he may have various skills but that is not being implemented in his work for example uh, in migration so many people go from rural to urban area right in search of jobs okay so when they are moving from rural to urban the skills he's acquired in his farmland 
he might not implement that in the urban area so this is called as educated unemployment or sometimes for the education that he has received he may not be able to put that in his work so that is called as educated unemployment what is called as under unemployment so under utilization of manpower is called as under employment for example if a doctor is working as a clerk so he has put so many years of his uh, time and skills into being a doctor but he is working under a clerical job so this is called as under employment fine so these are the kinds of unemployment in our indian economy so the next kind of unemployment is voluntary unemployment in which the person neither seek employment nor available for the work he is voluntarily retired of the work that is he is not willing to work so those people who come under the voluntary employment it will not be in the labor force we already dealt with this labor force is the people who are employed plus unemployed that is who is seeking for work the people who is not seeking for any kind of job will not come under the labor force fine so this is called as voluntary unemployment so next we are going to deal with a very important term engels law okay so engels law states that with increase in income the expenditure spent on food falls down you may think today i am earning 1000 rupees if tomorrow i am earning 2000 i may spend a lot for food right but it doesn't work in that way let's see the example see today i am earning 3000 per month okay so for food i am spending 1500 so in 3000 1500 is 50 percentage so my total income from the total income 50 percentage i am spending for food fine tomorrow i am joining some other company and i am earning 10000 per month but on food item i am spending 3500 so there is an absolute increase in the number from 1500 to 3500 on food spending is higher but when you compare so look here when 1500 i was spending on food now i am spending 3500 so 2000 has risen my food expenditure has risen to 2000 so this is an absolute term this 2000 is an absolute number but when you compare on the whole when i am earning 10000 my food expenditure is 3500 so on this 10000 3500 is 35 percentage but when i was earning 3000 i spent 1500 on food right so that is 50 percentage i spent on food now i am spending only 35 percentage on food so this is what is quoted in engels law so engels law states that when the increase in income when there is an increase in income the expenditure spent on food falls down okay i hope you got the point that is from the 50 percentage to 35 percentage the food expenditure is getting reduced so the last term in this lesson is kersnet curve so what is called as kersnet curve it was proposed by an economist simon kersnet okay so this is the curve it will be an inverted bell shaped curve fine so over here it denotes inequality in the y axis and per capita income in the x axis so how can we uh, decode this so in a developing economy initially the inequality will increase so take example india after we got independence in 1947 right after this india started developing right so we are under the category of a developing nation or a developing country so on our initial stages the inequality will increase so in our economy the inequality will be higher fine and with increase in the growth the inequality will come down so slowly from 1947 to 1950 1960 we will be excelling in each category of the economy so slowly when there is an economic growth in our economy the inequality will come down so at the starting the inequality will be rising in a developing nation like this and after the growth slowly the economic growth will take place after that the inequality will come down so this is denoted in the kersnet curve so proposed by simon kersnet and that's it for the video with this uh, we come to an end of the fourth chapter poverty and unemployment please subscribe to our channel get into ias and uh, in the description box given below we have enlisted the telegram channel link so please join the telegram channel for further updates thank you for watching